Hi, morning, everyone. I'm going to do uh, two things. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to HomeAway. And then rather than just taking all my time to tell you about HomeAway, I'm going to talk about a business model dilemma that we've gone through as a company over the, over the last few years. Because I think it's informative to many of you as you're thinking about your businesses in the early stage of their development. So um, a little bit about HomeAway. HomeAway is a global business. We're based in Austin, Texas. Um, and we have operations all around the world. About 40% of our business is in the US, about 40% in Europe, and at the moment about 10% in Asia Pacific. Um, we are a collection of brands, so many people haven't heard of Home Away, but have heard about one of the brands within the portfolio. These are all brands that um, are online marketplaces for vacation rentals. So if you're going on holiday and don't want to stay in a traditional hotel product, you can go to any one of these brands all around the world, and they have a collection of vacation rentals, um, beautiful homes, apartments, etc., in resorts and cities, as an alternative to staying in a hotel. Normally at this point, people say, oh, so you're kind of like Airbnb. Um, and it's true in some ways we are like Airbnb. Obviously, they're an incredibly well-known uh, business with a great PR machine. Um, but there are some differences. So there are some things that are the same and some things that are different. We were actually founded a couple of years ahead of them. We're 10 years old as a company. They're about seven years old as a company. Both the platforms have about a million listings all around the world on them. Um, home Away has focused more on whole homes. So um, uh, whereas Airbnb uh, came about with the idea that you could sleep in the corner and then has gradually grown from there into a platform where that also offers whole homes, Home Away is always exclusively whoops, focused on the idea of um, whole homes um, because we think that if you stay in a whole home, you get the privacy and space that you don't get if you stay in a hotel. And we, we really see our competition as being hotels. Uh, we believe that for families or for groups, uh, whether that's groups of friends or groups of families, that staying in a hotel is just a really poor experience. You maybe get some rooms next to each other, but you probably don't. You don't have anywhere for the kids to play. Um, when you wake up in the morning, you have to spend 30 $30 or 100 ringgit on a breakfast. Um, it's just not a great experience for families. It's not a great experience for groups, whereas whole homes are a great experience. And therefore, we focus more on holiday destinations. Uh, so these will be resorts uh, or anywhere else that you maybe go on holiday, whereas our competition has focused more on city destinations and for millennials. So there are some similarities, but there are also some differences. We're also around twice the size of um, Airbnb. Our our gross bookings um, on the platform were about 16 billion this year. Um, Airbnb's gross bookings, they're a private company, but they do reveal some information about the number of bookings and the average booking value. So we're about twice the size of them, which is actually um, interesting because we probably get about a tenth of the publicity. Um, however, our market valuation is a fraction of theirs. We are a public company, so our market valuation is very, very real. Uh, you can go and buy a stock in this company if you want to. Airbnb is a private company and raised recently at a valuation of 24 billion. Um, this is something that bothers us. Um, why, why are we a public company with 16 billion in gross bookings and only a 3 billion market cap? Well, there's a few reasons for this. Um, a lot of it is down to business model. Um, I love this quote because um, it, it kind of gets you, gets you thinking about the idea of, of business models. And uh, you know, one of, you know, I, I really enjoyed Azran's presentation this morning where he's talking about Air Asia X because it's not, it's not enough to have a good idea. You've got to have a fundamental, um, a fundamental solid understanding of what the business model is of, a, of something like Air Asia X. What is their competitive advantage? So um, why is our valuation a lot less uh, than theirs? It's not because of profitability. Uh, we, we have EBITDA of a couple of hundred million a year. Um, our competition is still loss making. Um, so it's really, a, a lot of it is down to business model, we think. And this is something that we've been wrestling with for the past couple of years and are in a process of transitioning. So what is HomeAway's business model? Well, HomeAway started 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, um, particularly for this type of, of, of accommodation, um, most of the owners, because these will be individual people who own second homes, were not comfortable with the idea of transacting online. So rather than setting up a classic e-commerce marketplace model, we went with a model where we said, okay, we will charge you, the owner or the seller in the marketplace, a fixed classified subscription price for all you can eat. So however much demand we bring to you, we'll charge you a price. Um, Typically, uh, uh, that was about four to five hundred dollars a year um, to be on the platform, and then however much demand came to you, 
you, that, was, that was up to you. We weren't going to take any further commission on that. The model evolved over the years. There were ways you could indicate you wanted more demand and you could pay a little bit more. There were ways you could indicate you wanted less demand and pay a bit, little bit less. But fundamentally, this was our business model choice. Our competition went for a model that was to charge the buyer, uh, so in this case, the traveler, um, and so uh, and a, basically a pay-as-you-go performance fee. So um, if you list your property on Airbnb, you as the owner will pay 3% commission every time uh, uh, somebody chooses to stay in your home, but you'll also, as the traveler, the traveler will also pay a 12% commission. So a fundamentally different business model that has the result of an effective commission difference of 4% in our case versus 13% in the competition's case. Um, and this is a big reason why our valuation is a heck of a lot lower than their valuation. Kind of simple reason, really. So why is this? And I think this is, this is the informative thing because you know, no one sort of sits down and says, hey, we should have a 4% commission and our competition should have a, when, when, when we know our competition has a margin that's three to four times bigger. I think fundamentally the subscription model was a gr good idea when it's really, really hard to get the money off the buyer. So for those of you who run classified businesses that are about um, maybe sort of big transactions like buying a house, um, it's really hard to get the money off the buyer because you're not going to be necessarily party to the transaction. There's going to be an awful lot of back and forth, an awful lot of conversations that have to happen. So it's very difficult to get the money off the buyer. Or maybe you won't know whether the, the transactions happen because there's a whole series of steps that have to happen. So transaction models are... Sorry, subscription models make sense in that situation. And they also please investors. Um, once you've got a subscription model and you've got a, you've got a customer, you can then just tell your investors what your renewal rate is, and it's very, very easy to forecast what your revenue is going to look like this year, next year, next year. You just have to tell two metrics, how many new customers you're signing up each year, and what's your renewal rate or your churn rate. So it's, it's, it's a model that investors love because it's incredibly easy to understand. However, and this is the biggest problem, they create poor incentives and weak alignment in any marketplace. Us as an operator of a marketplace reach a point where we feel, okay, we're, we're bringing in enough demand to maintain our renewal rate. So we're bringing in enough demand for all of our owners to keep on renewing their subscription, but we don't have any, incentive, any, any sort of really strong incentive to keep on going out and find extra marginal demand. You know, to go and spend that little extra dollar on marketing to bring one more person in to, to, to create that little bit of extra demand. And that's okay for a period, but over the long term, it really weakens your incentives. It, it, it means that you're not interested in perhaps going and launching an affiliate program to find extra demand, because you've got enough demand to keep your renewal rate up, and you don't have any marginal economics to share with a partner in an affiliate program anyway. So there's all these little things that keep on chipping away um, at your sort of desire to grow your marketplace. Obviously, we want to grow our marketplace because we're in business and we feel like, okay, you've got to keep on growing your marketplace. But at the margin, you constantly make these little, little trade-offs. So whilst it was the right model for us 10 years ago when homeowners would not put their, their houses online and would not allow a transaction to happen without a whole series of conversations and wanting to vet the, own, vet the travelers and really understand these things, um, it's gradually, I think, reduced some of those incentives. On the other hand, a performance model or a commission model, it, it, it means that you're, you're constantly seeking out that most marginal transaction. You're constantly looking for the, for the, for the person who you can spend $100 on acquiring and make $101 back in terms of revenue because that's still profitable for you. And I think that really sharpens your focus on constantly building the marketplace. Um, it's also an, an, a lot easier to get lots and lots of little checks. It's a lot easier to get your commission on lots and lots and lots of little transactions and just take a little, a little rake off every transaction than it is to go to an owner and say, hey, I'm going, to get, I'm going to give you 50 transactions over the course of the year, so please write me a check for $5,000. Even though they may write you 10 checks for $500 or 100 checks for $50 over the course of the year on a performance model, going and asking for $5,000 at the very beginning is a heck of a lot harder. So another advantage of moving to the commission model is you get a lot more little checks rather than this one big check. So as a company, we've been transitioning. Um, 
Uh, we are in Asia Pacific already 80% towards along this way in terms of moving to a commission model. Uh, Asia business is growing now at triple digits. And our Australia and New Zealand businesses that were much older businesses, they were both about eight to 10 years old. Um, they were actually acquisitions we made. Um, those businesses had stopped growing by, by moving to this commission model versus a subscription model. We've got growth back to about 30% in those businesses, which is good for an eight to 10 year old business. So it's a difficult transition to make, but I think it's been an important one and it, it's one that hopefully you can think about um, when you're thinking about setting up your business models. So that's all I had, my three takeaways. Um, HomeAway is the world's largest vacation rental company. We started 10 years ago, and we started with a subscription model, which has worked phenomenally for us, it got us through an IPO, got us through an, an ever-increasing share price. But um, it doesn't really align us with this idea of constantly building uh, the marketplace, and we've made that transition now to a commission performance model, and uh, things going well, but um, like anything, it's always a difficult transition. That's all I had. Thanks very much. Enjoy your day.